Hey guys, I'm going to talk to you about Boltzmann H theorem. To begin, what is the main idea of Boltzmann's work? Uh, thermodynamics uh, at the time was essentially an empirical theory. There were some preliminary works done by Maxwell that is giving thermodynamics a more mathematical description, but uh, it's there were some miss missing steps and Boltzmann seeks to build a bridge between these two words, between thermodynamics and mechanics. And also, uh, when he does that, he establishes a link between the microscopic world done by dynamics of collision of particles and the macroscopic world expressed by thermodynamics. We are going to start formulating the problem with some assumptions and some definitions, and then I'll show you the transport equation. This transport equation is what is used to establish the Boltzmann H theorem. I'm going to show you the theorem and discuss the consequences of it especially two paradoxes that were raised at the time, and we're going to see here that there are no paradoxes at all. And in the end, I'm going to close the presentation with some remarks about this work. Boltzmann's transport equation first appearance was in a paper in 1872, and it tells about the evolution of a probability density of a gas velocity. As a curiosity, it was the first appearance in literature of an evolution equation for a probability density. And Boltzmann's intention here was to obtain, using Newtonian mechanics, the Maxwell distribution for the velocity of a gas in a thermodynamical equilibrium. At the time, only the Maxwell distribution, after it named it the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. And also, he wants to show that for a generic probability distribution, it will tend asymptotically to the Maxwell distribution. Just reviewing some assumptions of the kinetic theory of gases, Boltzmann is working with a gas of n molecules enclosed in a box of volume V, with a sufficiently low density to avoid higher complex interactions. Each molecule will be treated as hard spheres, so with a well-defined position and well-defined momentum. Two molecules will be distinguishable from each other, and the interaction occurs through binary collisions, so we can neglect higher order collisions. Now, to start discussing the transport equation, we have to define what is the probability distribution F, which will be the number of molecules lying in a volume of the phase space. If we integrate over all phase space, we recover the total number of molecules of the gas. By Liouville's theorem, it states that the phase space density should behave like an incompressible fluid. So if, have, if we have nothing that affects its distribution, uh, when evolving in time, the probability distribution should preserve itself. However, we actually have something that is affecting the probability distribution because we have the molecules colliding with each other and it can change this distribution when it evolves in time. So we have to add an, an extra term here that is related to the change of distribution in time due to collision. Now look into the equation, let look to the left hand side of the equation and expand it in first order in delta t. When we do this, we have the first appearance here of a Boltzmann transport equation. Our next question is, what is the format of this term related to collisions? Molecules can enter or leave this volume in phase space to, due to binary collisions. So let's treat them then as entering with velocities v1 prime and v2 prime, colliding and leaving with velocities v1 and v2. We can solve this using scattering theory. We won't get to get in detail here with that but we just define here some transition function w that is related to this scattering cross-section. And we also gonna define that uh, function capital F of vi and vj that is related to the number of pairs of vi and vj at the time t. So in the bottom line, we can see that this term will be related to this cross-section term. And the number of pairs that are entering the volume at the time t minus the number of pairs that are leaving the volume at a time t. Now, the key assumption that Boltzmann uses to treat this, this collision factor is how to treat this cross-correlation function, because it could be a very complicated function, but he assumes that uh, we, what he calls the molecular chaos assumption, that the, the mole those molecules are statistically independent from each other. So this cross-correlation will be just the product of the distribution functions of each velocity. In doing that, we have the final exp uh, expression for our Boltzmann transport equation, that is this big expression here. And I'm going to write it in a shorter form now. So here we have the shorter form, 
we use the arguments directly on the function. So f of v1 prime will be just f1 prime. Now to solve it, uh, Boltzmann is uh, dealing with a rarefied gas in a volume v. Just it, so we don't have an external force, and it's we can assume that the distribution is independent of position. So it will be just a uh, distribution about the velocity and time. We also can define the equilibrium distribution function as the distribution that is independent of time. So it will be dependent only of velocity. And in this case, when you plug in back into the, the equation, we're going to find that partial f partial t will be equal to zero. And if we look inside the, the, the integrand, a sufficient condition to be equal to zero is just that this relation between the cross correlation functions be equal to zero. Now we're going to hold that result for a while and def define the Boltzmann functional, h that is the integral over the phase space of f log f. If we de derivate this functional on, on time and set it equal to zero, we're going to see that uh, it's the equivalent that, uh, to say that the partial derivative of f with t equals to zero. So dh dt equals to zero is a necessary condition for equilibrium distribution. Having this functional, we can now uh, state the Boltzmann H theorem that says that if f satisfies Boltzmann transport equation with all its assumptions, then dh dt has to be lower or equal to zero. The proof of this theorem is quite simple and I'm going to give you a brief explanation about it. We start inserting the transport equation inside the functional derivative and we're going to see that we have an integration over all the velocities involved in the problem. So, looking to the symmetries of the problem, we should expect that this integral is invariant if we change v1 and v2. So we do this and calculate now exchanging v1 and v2. But also by the symmetries, you also should expect that the integral to be invariant if we change the pairs v1 and v2 and v1 prime v2 prime. So we exchange again this, this pairs and we have another expression for the dt. And now we add all these equations in one equation that is more symmetric with 1, 2, 1 prime and 2 prime. And if we look to this equation, we have here a product of f1 prime f2 prime minus f1 f2 times log f1 f2 minus f log f1 prime f2 prime. If the first term of this product is positive, the second one will be negative. If the first term of this product is negative, the second one will be positive. So the product will be always lower or equal to zero. And then we can prove, we are just prove that the agent is lower or equal to zero. Now, what are the consequences of it? First of all, we proved that the, the, the agent is lower than equals to zero. And this equality holds only when f1 prime, f2 prime is equal to f1, f2. That is the equilibrium condition that we stated before. It also shows that this functional has a minimum value at the equilibrium condition and then arbitrary conditions will tend to it when uh, asymptotically. And you can also see that using the, the expression here for the equality, if we apply the logarithmic log in both sides, we have some additive functions of velocity. And also we can compare now this with the conserved quantities of the, the system. There is conserved momentum and conserved kinetic energy. And so we can associate the log of f as a function uh, related to the moment, to, to linearly to the velocity or quadratic velocity that is related to moments and kinetic energy. And manipulating this, we're going to find uh, Maxwell, Maxwell distribution. So, Boltzmann proves there that Maxwell distribution is uh, equilibrium distribution and also that uh, an arbitrary condition will tend to it asymptotically. And finally, the most controversial consequence, when we prove that the HDT is lower than equals to zero, we actually setting that there is a preferred direction of time. So, and this assumption were not very well accepted for many physicists at the time, and we're going to see now some of the problems that they were uh, raised about it.
Well, to set this preferred direction in time was not the new result. We already had the second law of thermodynamics that was stated before Boltzmann by Clausius and by Carnot. And uh, it was an empirical formulation that supported what was observed in the macroscopic world. So things go forward in time, but they don't reverse. Now, the difference now is if we define S as proportional to minus H, we could provide a kind of a proof of this reverse reversibility of the second law. And this was not very well accepted. A lot of questions were raised. One of them is called the Loschmidt's paradox, that actually a paradox about reversibility, that says that uh, if H decreases from time zero to T, in a time t these velocities are reversed, then because of the symmetries of the equations, uh, it would be just as like it would be going back after t, and then h should increase. So this would be in contrast with what the h theorem was telling, and now we're going to see what happens. And the answer here is in the molecular chaos assumption. It states that their molecules are statistically independent from each other, and this is not always true. Actually, after they collide, the particles are highly correlated with the velocities. So, what is the Boltzmann theory actually saying? It says that when the chaos, molecular chaos is satisfied, then the H dt is lower than or equal to zero. Now we can see that if this is satisfied, then H has to be in a local peak. Let's look to the figure here on the right. Let's say that uh, we have in the state B, the molecular chaos is assumed, so the H dt is lower than or equal to zero, we evolve to state C. If come back to B and reverse now in time, the molecular chaos is assumed, so the H dt is lower than or equal to zero, so B evolves to A. But now if it's not in local peak, the gas must not be in a molecular chaos state. So you can be in state A and have the HT greater than or equal to zero to evolve to time B. So only on local peaks, molecular chaos is assumed. And looking this, we see that there is no actually a paradox here. But if the theorem works only for that particular state, is it really useful? Well, the point here is that molecular collisions can create or destroy molecular chaos. So the molecules, let's suppose two molecules are, are statistically independent, they collide, they become dependent. But then one of these molecules right, will be colliding with other one that is uncorrelated with that. So they are again in molecular chaos and they collide again and go on and go on. And so actually we have a lot of uh, subsections of molecular chaos. And we suppose that these collisions are at random. Actually what we're going to see is that H fluctuates within a noise range of chaos and not chaos, chaos and not chaos. And if we simulate that collisions, we actually see that. We have two figures here. First, let's look to the figure on the left. That is a gas, gas in equilibrium. We can see the lower, the bottom dashed line, that is the equilibrium line. And we see that a fluctuation in what we call a noise range. So the gas will fluctuate the states, H will fluctuate in the states of this, this range. And sometimes there is one collision that will put the gas in a state that is beyond this noise range. But what happens then is that the state is quickly restored and the probability of this happening is very close to zero. So it won't affect the, the overall system. On the right, we have now a situation that the gas is not in equilibrium. So we have a dashed curve that is governed by the transport equation. And we can see by this dashed curve that the HDT goes lower than or equal to zero. And age actually the, 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 the solid line will fluctuate around this average. So the transport equation sets an average and uh, actually the age theorem shows that the, the functional will fluctuate around it. So we can move to the second question here that is Zermelo's paradox, which is based on Poincaré's recurrence theorem. Poincaré's theorem says that any mechanical system whose motion takes place in a bounded region of, say, space 
after some finite time t, the system should return arbitrarily close to the initial conditions. Souser Mello said that by this, age of t cannot be a monotone function of time. However, we have just seen on last slide that age of t is not always a monotone function of time. So there is no paradox at all here. This actually only shows how the theorem was misinterpreted by some physicists at the time. Because, as I said, it was the first time that a probability density was treating as evolving in time. And physicists were used to deal with mechanics that is highly determinist. And so a probability evolution is something new to, to them. And then should it raise some questions and confusions like this one. And actually, if we try to check the Poincaré theorem in the noise range due by the variations of h, we can see that the small fluctuations will repeat themselves. And for the large fluctuations, even if they have probability almost zero, we can calculate the time delta t that they will take to repeat. And we, we call this a Poincaré cycle, and would be proportional to e elevated to the power of the number of degrees of freedom. If we have 10 to the 23 molecules here, the time would be e to the 10 to the 23, and this is actually infinite time. So it's much higher than the age of the universe. It's not physical to discuss that. So there is no paradox within it too. And after this, we are ready to conclude this presentation. Just a few remarks about Boltzmann's work. We saw here that it builds bridges between thermodynamics and mechanics, between micro and macro worlds. It also shows how irreversibility emerges and that we need a large number of particles and some suitable initial conditions like molecular chaos to it. And especially this great conclusion here is that irreversibility cannot be understood solely with the laws of mechanics. It's not a deterministic law, it's the result of a probabilistic nature. So we could say that second law of thermodynamics loses conceptually the status of absolute law and now it becomes to be a probabilistic event. Some references if you want to know more about it. My main reference was Kerson Huang's statistical mechanics book and this article from Falciani and Vulpiani that talks about Boltzmann's life with historical approach combined with modern discussion. Also, a different approach to the problem you can find in Carter, that's deeper approach, deeper discussion, he discussed even collisions with higher orders there. And if you want to look more of, from a historical perspective, there is this book from Carlos Sertigiani that tells how deeply, well, how about Boltzmann and Boltzmann's life, how he reacted to the questions that were raised and uh, the complexity of his articles and the difficulty from the physicists there that to understand it is a seems a very interesting book. So thank you very much.